we have been looking at some aspects of the perfect gifts that God has given unto us. We well, noted first the perfect book, which is, of course, the Bible. And we've been looking at the perfect character, which is, of course, Jesus the Christ. And we noted that he is perfect in his modality, that is, he is both God and man. He is both. He was perfect in his morality. He lived a sinless life, went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, as Peter describes it in Acts 10th chapter. We began noticing that he is perfect in his message. That message is love for God and love for our fellow man. And as we were looking at love for one another, it's going to be certainly practicing that type of love that is seen in the degree that he loved us, John 13, verse 34. It is a practicing of righteousness before all and practicing the golden rule, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Matthew 7 and verse 12, and as we paraphrase it. It's providing things honest in the sight of all men, as Paul would mention in Romans 12th chapter. It's showing compassion, kindness, benevolence toward others. It's forgiving one another, as well as seeking forgiveness when we have transgressed or sinned against someone else. But it's also having a proper speech. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 37, Jesus says, But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more of this than this cometh of evil. He's setting forth the fact that we, as his followers, are to be truthful in nature. One of the great problems that we have in our society, no doubt, is the fact that people lie. The very fact that we have to continually hire lawyers to go over every contract and we want to make sure that uh, those contracts are in writing and not just oral contracts anymore is because you can't trust people. They're going to lie. And most people, sadly, think that lying is all right now. It has become such an accepted part of society that not only is it all right to lie, it is expected that others are going to lie and that we are going to lie. But Jesus teaches us against such. You're to be truthful in what you say. Later on, Jesus would state, Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37, that I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. He sets forth for our consideration the very fact that our words, we're going to be judged by them. And we're not to speak idle words. Paul might explain that very well in Ephesians 4 and verse 29 when he says to let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And yet in our society again today, we see that it has become commonplace to use vile, ungodly, corrupt, rude, and you can use probably a half dozen other adjectives of the speech of our day. And on top of that, you can add the taking of the Lord's name in vain. Of course, Jesus says that God's name is to be hallowed in that example prayer in Matthew 6 and verse 9. Hallowed be thy name. We have a respect, a reverence for the name of God. But so many times, we don't see that in our society today. God's name is disrespected. And it's used for any old common thing, 
instead of being reserved for that which is holy and right. The whole idea of profane was the idea of before the temple. It was something that was outside of the temple, something that had been dedicated to God or consecrated to God, a part of the temple, was holy thus. We are to be a holy people. But things that were outside of the temple were for common usage. God's name is to be holy. It is a part of that which is not to be used in that common, profane way. And yet, we see it in our society being used in the profane, common way, instead of being held in respect and reverence. We as Christians need to speak in a different way than the people of the world speak. They should be able to tell that there is a difference between the way they talk and the way we talk. I'll just mention one illustration. I am a member of a, and I'm sure y'all can't imagine me being a member of a Dallas Cowboy community. I know that y'all know that I, you know, that's just not a, a part of my nature, but uh, <clears throat> on a regular basis. Uh, someone will say, sorry, Michael, and then use a bad term. They apologize to me because they know that I don't approve of it. And sooner or later, I'm going to say, you need to stop apologizing to me and start apologizing to God. But see, there's a difference in the way in which people talk at least there should be in relationship to the Christian and the person of the world. And most of those cases, they're not taking the Lord's name in vain. It's just corrupt, vile language. But there should be a difference because our language, our word, should be that which builds people up, edifies people. And that's what Paul goes on to say there in Ephesians 4.29. But Jesus certainly talked about proper speech. He also spoke about immorality and marriage. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus says, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This sets forth the stage of the proper dress or the clothing that we are to wear, that we should not wear clothing that would be provocative in nature. Look at so much of the clothing of our society today. It appeals to the opposite sex and tries to draw attention to the physical body. It literally tries to objectify women in particular. That they are nothing but objects upon which men are to lust after. And it thus the clothing appeals to that aspect. But if you think it's only the clothing, look at just about everything that's sold today. As the old statement goes in advertising, sex sells. And so what do they appeal to? That's what they appeal to because that's what sells. And so it doesn't matter what they are say selling. In fact, how many times do you, after looking at a commercial on television, can say, turn and say, what were they advertising? Because... That what they, what they are advertising is unimportant. The only thing that was important was the sex and the appeal to that lustful aspect. And so it, it lays a foundation for the proper clothing that we as Christians should wear 
that we should be dressed modestly. And if you want a description of what's modest, go into the Old Testament and, stu and start studying what nakedness is all about. Because people could be clothed and yet be naked as far as a biblical definition of the term. So what is nakedness? When does one become naked? And it begins in Genesis, the third chapter, when God, yes, Adam and Eve recognized, but God did as well that Adam and Eve were naked even though they had sewed fig leaves together to cover parts of their body. But they recognized they were still naked. Why? Because it did not clothe enough of the body. And so God made coats of skin. Those coats covered from the shoulders to the knees. And God starts thus beginning to, at that point in time, showing us when you start uncovering that area between the shoulders and the knees, you're naked. Well, that's nakedness. We're going to be avoiding that and dressing in such a way as to show Christianity and not simply appeal to the physical desires of the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. But it also shows the aspect of men. And, you know, there's this old statement, well, some men are so vile that uh, it doesn't matter what a woman would. That's true. And that's wrong. Men need to keep their thoughts holy and pure. But that doesn't alleviate a woman when she dresses immodestly either. There are some that, yes, it doesn't matter what a woman would wear, they're going to lust after a woman. A woman doesn't have to contribute to the sin, though. But the man is to keep their thoughts pure. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. Purity of thought. Don't look on a woman to lust after her in your heart. And then he's in Matthew the 19th chapter. He begins teaching about that aspect of marriage. And how that God joins a man and a woman. Not two men, not two women. And I don't care how many times they can, homosexuals can desire to have marriages. It's never going to be a marriage because God will never join them together. It is a perversion. It always has been a perversion of God's design and order. And it always will be. Doesn't matter if we legalize it or if the Supreme Court says you have to marry them. No, we don't have to do that which is contrary to God's word. He sets forth, though, that when you have an eligible man and an eligible woman and they unite themselves in that holy matrimony, that God joins them together. Now then, many of the principle or all of the principles that God gives in relationship to our dealings one with another and righteousness and forgiveness and kindness and compassion and all of these things that we've been talking about, those things should rule even more so within the marriage relationship. It seems as if some individuals will be that in relationship to others, but when they go home, they seem to forget, I don't have to, and say, I don't have to act that way toward my spouse toward my children. And that's wrong. Those principles should be exemplified within the home. But he also within that home says that a man and woman are to remain faithful to each other. And they are not to divorce one another, put one another away. He does allow one reason or one cause and that is for the cause of fornication. And if you do it and it's not for that cause and you marry someone else, you commit adultery and you always will continue to commit adultery until you get out of that relationship, sinful relationship. And so Christ gives a perfect message in relationship to immorality and marriage. 
He also gives a perfect message in relationship to worship. In Matthew the tenth or the fourth chapter in verse ten, as Satan is tempting Jesus, he says, I'll give you all of these kingdoms of the world if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus' response is, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He sets forth for our consideration in this proper worship. We are to worship God. Recognizing the fact that man is going to worship something. Man has always worshipped something. He always will worship something. Every society that has, ever been, that has ever existed upon the face of this earth has worshipped some object, some thing. Years or centuries ago, it might have been a physical object likened to an idol that they made. You see that in the Old Testament a great deal. You don't see the idolatry like that today, except from more of a mental standpoint. It might be popularity, it might be money, it might be this or that, but they're going to worship something. That is their object of worship. And Jesus is setting forth for our consideration our duty to worship God and not anything else. And then as he's speaking to the Samaritan woman in John the fourth chapter, she is asking about the aspect of worship. We Samaritans worship in this mountain, that's Mount Gerizim. The Jews worship in Jerusalem. Which one is the proper place of worship? And so Jesus teaches her a lesson about what's going to come in relationship to New Testament times. That the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And while we won't spend much time this morning in relationship to that, it gives us three aspects of worship in this. It is our, the object of our worship, the Father, the attitude of worship being done in spirit, and the actions of worship being done according to God's will or truth. And so Jesus sets forth for us proper worship, he has a perfect message in relationship to our worship to God. And he also has a perfect message regarding the church. In Matthew, the fourth chapter, it says that from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's in Matthew 4 and verse 17, immediately after his baptism. He comes up out of the water, and from that time, he begins to preach. Repent. For what reason? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we start studying the New Testament, we find that the kingdom is the church. And so Jesus at that time began preaching about the church. These individuals, likened to Dan Billingsley and others who have come along and said, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament things. And that Jesus was simply explaining the Old Testament to people. Well, no, he wasn't. He was preaching about the church. He was giving principles for us today. He wasn't trying to explain the Old Testament. What good would that have been? It was going to be done away with at the end of his ministry anyway. He's giving principles by which we are to live. He's dealing with the church of our Lord. So he began telling, repent for the kingdom of the church is at hand. It's near. It's coming upon you. And he's setting forth these principles concerning it. As they come to Caesarea Philippi, 
as recorded in Matthew the 16th chapter, after asking the apostles who men thought he was, he asked them who they thought he was. And Peter, responding for them, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus' response is, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, literally shall have, shall have already been bound and remains bound in earth, Whatsoever thou art in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall have already been loosed and remains loosed in heaven. That's the actual meaning of the Greek verbal tenses in that verse. Of course, the King James didn't translate it like that, but that's the meaning of it. Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of that kingdom. What's that kingdom? It's the church. What's it being built on? It's being built upon that statement that Peter made that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus says. Now upon that foundation rock, I'm going to build the church. That's the basis of it. That's the foundational element. Now then, in relationship to that church, whatever you bind on earth, and whatever you loose on earth is what God has already determined to be bound and loosed. You're going, Peter, you're going to be using the keys. Keys signify authority. I have some keys on a key ring here. That key right there is the key to my office. Notice I said my office. It gives me the authority to go into that office. You don't have the key. In fact, I dare say there's not a person here right now that has that key other than me. What does that mean? It means that you don't have the authority to go into the office. What if I give you the key? You now have the authority to go into that office. Keys are signifying authority. Now, that doesn't mean that nobody can, uh, but it's, the point is that the keys represent authority. Peter, I'm going to give you the authority. What? To bind what God has bound and what God has loosed. God made the determination, and you're going to use the keys that have that authority to set forth what God has set forth to bind what God has bound, to loose what God has loosed. And on the day of Pentecost, for example, in relationship to the Jews, we see Peter using those keys. And the fact that he had convicted them of their sin, and they asked, well, men and brethren, what shall we do? And his response, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, what was he doing? Repent and be baptized. He was setting forth what God had bound upon them. For what purpose? So that they could have the remission of sins. The sins loosed from their lives. And thus Peter was using the keys of the kingdom to bind and loose what God had determined. In relationship to that message of the church that Jesus Christ was setting forth. And when we look at, again, Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus says, I will build my church. And we start learning that there's only one. Ephesians 4th chapter and verse 4, there is one body. We find in chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, that that body is the church. And so there's only one church. But wait a minute, Michael. I can get, go to the yellow pages and I can, start, I can open them up and I can find one after another, after another, after another, after another. And you just keep turning page after page after page with different churches. And you're going to tell me there's only one? That's what the Bible says. Well, what about all of these that were found in the yellow pages? 
where there might be churches of man, but they're not churches of Christ. Christ never built them. Christ didn't establish them. They're not built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. They're not teaching his perfect message. They're not binding and loosing what God has bound and loosed. So they're not his. But there is one that is. That's his church, the church of Christ. But then there's, not only did he give a perfect message of the church, he also gives a perfect message of salvation. As Jesus, after his death and resurrection, appears the last time to his apostles before ascending back to the Father. It's recorded in Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 19 and 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Luke 24, 46 and 47. In Matthew's account, he tells them, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Literally, that word teaches, make disciples of all nations baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Mark's account of it. Go ye therefore, or go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. In Luke's account of it, <coughs> He says, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. When we look at these three accounts of that, as we call it, the Great Commission, we learn that in order to be made a disciple of Jesus Christ, that is a follower of his, one who learns of him and follows him. And we find also in Acts 11th chapter and verse 26 that the disciples were called Christians. So in order to be made a disciple, a Christian, one must be baptized. Literally, it's into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're being baptized into a relationship with them. And there must be a teaching them to observe all that Jesus had commanded them. Thus, when those two actions are taken, a teaching them and a baptizing them, they can become, or they then become, a disciple of Jesus Christ. They become a Christian. In Mark's account of it, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. There's a message, that perfect message of salvation, that it takes belief. For without faith cannot please God, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. And so we must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We believe in God, we must also believe in Jesus Christ. And we must in this context believe the gospel that he died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and verse 4. We must believe. But in relationship to that belief, we must also be baptized. Now, word baptism very simply means a submersion. The element, as we find elsewhere in the scriptures, is water. And so it is a submersion in water in order to be saved. If you want salvation, that perfect message of salvation is he that believeth and is baptized. If you take away belief, you don't have a perfect message of salvation anymore. If you take away baptism, you no longer have that perfect message of salvation. It takes both of them. And then Luke adds in Luke 24, 24 46 and 47, that re repentance of sins or repentance and remission of sins should be preached. And thus we have repentance added to that aspect of salvation or in order to have the remission of our sins. Repentance is a turning away from sin and a turning to God in God's appointed way. 
It uh, comes as a result of our godly sorrow because we have transgressed the very nature of God and we want to be in a right relationship with him. And so I turn away from the sinful lifestyle and I turn to him, but I have to do it in the way in which he set forth. And thus we have he that believes, he that repents, he that is baptized. That's that perfect message of salvation that Jesus Christ established. And if you go through the book of Acts, you'll see the apostles preaching those aspects. A perfect message of salvation. But then also there is a perfect message of eternity. That there is an eternity awaiting for us. That eternity is one of two places. It is either in heaven or it is in hell. For those who are obedient to what God has stated and have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ according to that perfect message of salvation, heaven awaits that individual. On the other hand, if we fail to obey in relationship to that perfect message of salvation, in that perfect lifestyle in which he set forth, then only eternity in hell, hell an eternal punishment awaits. In Matthew the 13th chapter and verses 41 through verse 43, Jesus says that the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears, let him hear. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Jesus gives us a scene of the judgment. And he concludes it by stating in verse 46 that these, talking about those who fail to be compassionate toward others, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous... Those who have lived that right type of life here upon this earth, those who are right with God and with their fellow man, the righteous shall enter into life eternal. A perfect message of eternity. The question this morning for each and every one of us, are we prepared for that eternity? It's going to come for each and every one of us. When we die, judgment, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. And our eternity will be sealed at that point in time. To those who are obedient, yes, heaven waits. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord, Jesus says. To those who have engaged in sin, have failed to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then he'll tell them, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. There's that eternity that's awaiting us. Are you prepared for that salvation and for heaven? Or have you only prepared your life for hell? The choice is ours. If you need to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ to have your sins washed away, that perfect message of salvation, then why not come this morning? If you have not lived the type of life, that perfect message that Jesus Christ set forth, then why not come and make your life right with him? To live the type of lifestyle that he sets forth so that you can have that eternity in heaven awaiting you when you die or when Christ comes again. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.